Okay, well, I wanted to say right up front that when, how long have we been doing these, three years? Yes. Okay, three years ago when we first started, I said, do not ask me to do one of these. <laughs> so I really didn't want to, and then I don't know how many of these I've missed in three years, but not more than one or two. I try to always go, I love them, and last semester, um, I don't even remember whose presentation it was, but somebody was doing their presentation, and they had a lot of family photos up there, and I thought, okay, that would be a good excuse to show people family photos. <laughs> so I didn't tell her it was okay, but she did ask me one day, I, she said, has it been long enough? Can, I, can you do this? And I said, okay, I can do it in the spring. So um, one of the reasons I didn't want to do it very much was I really thought that my life was not very interesting and that I didn't really have very much to say. So uh, I've decided since then uh, that it still isn't that interesting, but I do have a few things to say, so I'm going to go ahead and, and make my attempt. Um, so I thought I'd start, see if I can make sure I do this correctly, telling you a little bit about my heritage because uh, something that I noticed uh, we're going to all these faculty forums is how we're all so different. We all come from so many different kinds of, of backgrounds. And my heritage is um, very working class. Um, I was a first generation college student and I don't come from that background of people who are all in education and you know there are no teachers in my family um, except my sister as a teacher also, but besides that, not really any background or heritage in this. And so this isn't something that I necessarily always wanted to do or always dreamed of doing. So I'll tell you a little bit about my, my background. This is a picture of my dad's parents, <coughs> William Perry, uh, excuse me, William Perry and Claire Bell Robinson Coffee. Um, people often will ask me, are you related to the coffees over here? Are you related to the coffees over there? Never knew a single coffee relative besides my grandpa. Um, didn't know any of his family, didn't know brothers and sisters, anything. Uh, Robinsons, on the other hand, they are all over Weatherford, and um, I'm related to all the Robinsons of the Metroplex. <laughs> so that's where my family uh, heritage is in that way. Um, my uh, grandfather worked in a steel mill when I was a child. That's the job I knew him. I know he had been a cowboy when he was younger, and then he'd left home from Arkansas and moved west and uh, worked in the steel mill, retired, and I remember when I was 10 years old, he had just retired, he had a heart attack and died. And uh, I think it really kind of set in my mind uh, some ideas about uh, retirement and death being sort of associated with each other <laughs> in some way. Uh, my, he was a very silent man who, who smoked a pipe and never said a word. Uh, my grandmother was uh, the youngest of something like 12 kids. And her um, two, all, both of her sisters and her old, next older brother all died of Alzheimer's. So I also have this sort of feeling of doom over me. Uh, my, my, uh, my dad, well, anyway, skip that part. I, was, I, I tend to go off on stories sometimes, so I'm going to try to stop myself from doing that. But when I was a child, she cooked all the time. She was a very, very good cook, uh, and she had a job in a potato chip factory. And I remember going to the potato chip factory and looking at the giant vaults of boiling oil. That, no, it was a real small local Fort Worth company. Uh, green, I can't remember the name of it, but anyway. It was, yeah. Um, she died when I was a junior at LCU. Um, this is a picture of my mom's parents. James Garland May and Roberta Lee Grover May. Um, James Garland uh, was from Alabama, and my grandmother was from the Panhandle of Oklahoma and Eastern Colorado. That's where she grew up. Uh, she was a Baptist. She's the only Baptist of my grandparents. They were all Church of Christ. So I do come from a Church of Christ heritage. She played the piano at her church when she was growing up. Um, and she was an artist. Uh, I'll talk about her more later. My grandfather uh, was real funny. Uh, he was kind of had uh, itchy feet, um, and a lot of people in my family do. Um, he moved constantly. He never could settle on a job. He had a chicken farm. He had a grocery store. He, uh, I don't remember what else. He was a jailer when I was a kid, and he took us to the jail. Uh, and the jail in Waterloo, Alabama, is kind of like the jail 
on uh, Andy Griffith. So, you know, um, he was drafted into World War II at the very, very end of the war. Uh, he had five kids, and he was in his late 30s. And he was the oldest man on the ship that he was on in the Pacific. And there's lots of stories about the officers calling him sir and things like that. Um, he was a real funny guy. He died of a massive heart attack when I was in high school, leaving my grandmother, who's still alive at 101, uh, a widow, uh, who immediately sold her house and decided that she didn't have long to live, even though she was in her early 60s. And she lived with one child after another ever since 1977. <laughs> So, this is a picture of my family when I was, uh, yeah, my grown uh, This is a picture of my family when I was probably a freshman or sophomore in college. Um, of course, there's me on the back left in one of my thinner years. I, I was a chubby kid and a chubby high school student uh, and lost a little weight in the end of my high school and stayed down during the first couple years of college and then gained it all back. So. My sister, uh, Leslie, who lives in this area, my brother Daniel, and then on the front row, my dad, my mom, and my youngest brother, Raphael. Um, I'll tell a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't. I thought I, I wanted to talk a little bit about my influences. Uh, well, my brother, we adopted him, or he, he was a foster child. My parents were foster parents, and we had him from the time he was two days old. So he's never lived with anyone else. And his name, Raphael, was actually my mother's older brother's name who died when he was 13 of uh, gastric problems. And so she always wanted to name a child after him, and so she named my brother. And everybody thinks it's a heritage name or something, but it's, she kind of wishes now maybe she hadn't named him that because it's such an unusual name that people connect it with race or something. <coughs> this is a picture of my grandmother, and... Um, she was kind of gorgeous, and that's a picture of her before she developed some dementia about 10 years ago when she was in her 90s. Um, she uh, used to paint all the time, and I, some of my earliest memories of my grandmother, we go to visit her in Alabama, she would be working on her painting. She had one bedroom that was completely set up as a studio, and she had oils everywhere, and her entire uh, house was covered with her oil paintings, and my mother's house is covered with oil paintings. So are all her sisters and brothers. We don't do, we don't do oil paintings like one wall. You know, there's one painting. It's like, doom, 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 <laughs> all the way around everybody's house. And I was so impressed with my grandmother. She, uh, she cooked, she canned. Um, you know, as I said, they had a chicken farm at one point in time when my mother was little. Uh, my mother, due to that, developed a hatred of chickens. <laughs> my... Uh, <laughs> My grandmother, you know, she has all these memories of my grandmother swinging the chickens and, you know, all that. And my mother would not cook, clean, kill, dress, or even eat chicken for years and years after that because her job was to feed the chickens and she would step on them when she would feed them and kill the little baby chickens. And she just was so traumatized by that. But anyway, my mother, my grandmother was a painter and I always admired her. Probably of all the people in my family, she was my hero. You know, I wanted to be like her. Um, my parents were also major influences in my life. My dad couldn't take a good picture. Um, I'd looked for a good picture of my dad, and there's hardly any of him smiling. He has this thing where he just, look, he just growls when he looks at a picture, looks at a camera. But um, my mother was, well, yeah. My mother's really pretty, too, and she uh, never really wanted to do anything besides be a wife and mother. That was her goal her entire life, never thought about a profession. Um, my dad was the oldest, and he was fairly ambitious uh, for somebody who came from his background. And he was in the Navy, learned to train to be an air traffic controller, and took a job as an air traffic controller when I was eight, um, and went to the brand new Houston Intercontinental Airport at that time and was the air traffic controller there. We stayed there for several years. Then he got a job in Love Field. His mother, my grandmother, was her health was getting bad, and he wanted to be there to take care of her. And so we, he moved up to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So when I was in the middle of the seventh grade, we moved to the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and my mother still lives in the house we moved into at that time. So I went to um, three elementary schools, three junior highs, 
in one high school, whereas my youngest two brothers hardly moved at all in their lives because of the timing there. <coughs> my father um, was um, always wanted me to be an engineer, a meteorologist, or an accountant, and he wanted me to go to Texas A&M University. Um, I was named after my father. I was the oldest. Um, well, we were doing that vocation uh, event on Tuesday. Patty Patterson asked to imagine that you had all the same background circumstances, but you were the other gender. So you, were, you would be a boy, you would be a girl. Uh, would you have chosen? Would you be where you are now? And I said, yeah, probably, because I was very pushed to go into a male track. Um, I never thought I would be married. I never thought I would have children. I, was, I imagined my life single and professional. That was how I always imagined myself. So I was raised to think of myself that way, and whenever I was treated like a girl, I didn't quite get it. Uh, I was always like, that's kind of strange. Why are they treating me like a girl? So I don't have some of those preconceived gender concepts, but he always thought because I was a good student and I was smart that I needed to do something smart that would make lots of money. That was his goal for me. Um, when I was in, um, I think I was a junior here, uh, well, okay, back, back up just a little bit. My father came from a long line of Democrats, and he, the first Republican he ever voted for was Ronald Reagan, because Reagan campaigned with the Air Traffic Controller Union uh, to support them, and then he fired them when they went on strike, when they didn't get what they wanted. And he told the entire family that we would all be disowned if we ever voted Republican from then on. And I was, I have kept that, I have kept that. So. He would always say, you're my favorite child. Um, I'm not really conveying my father's humor. He was one of the funniest men I've ever known. So when he said that, it was always tongue-in-cheek, but it was kind of serious. I was his favorite child. But um, he would say, you're the only one still in the will, things like that. Uh, to, his, to his dying day, he was funny. Um, okay, teachers. I'm going to talk a little bit about some teachers who were influences on me. Um, as I said before, as I was going through school, I was always very uh, determined and kind of um, overachiever. Part of that was because we moved every two years and I didn't have any friends. So I didn't have anything to do besides be a good student. So that was the way I tried to make my reputation. I would go to a new school, I would sit on the front if I could, and I would try to be the smartest person in class. And it became my goal to be the first one to finish everything too because it wasn't enough to have the best grade. I also wanted to finish before everybody else. So I was very competitive with myself. Um, besides the fact that my father was very supportive and encouraging of me going into a career when I was in high school, my parents never really pushed me at all on my grades. Um, they looked at our report cards, uh, didn't look at mine because they were boring. And I mean, my mother actually said that one time, I don't need to look at your report cards because you make the same thing every time and it'll just make your brothers and sisters feel bad. <laughs> so I didn't get a lot of pushing from my parents. I didn't get a lot of support, but um, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. I did kind of think about being a teacher. I thought about being an artist. Um, all I did, um, well, I'll talk about that here in a little bit, but I wanted to talk about the first art teacher that I had that was really an encouragement to me. I got online. I, was, I did so much research for this. I didn't know what had happened to Mrs. Colson. She was my ninth grade art teacher. And I, she has a little website because she's an artist. And so that's one of her current paintings. But she was my ninth grade art teacher, and she's the one that really taught me how to draw. Um, I've had many art teachers since then. None of them taught me to draw like Mrs. Colson did. And um, she was just fantastic uh, and very encouraging to me. I was... Uh, we started a brand new junior high in ninth grade. It was uh, Smithfield Junior High, so we were the first class, and I met my best friend there, Denise, and we were both artists, and we got to paint the, the logo and the gym floor and, you know, stuff like that. It was a really fun year for me. Um, whoops, I went ahead, but uh, Mrs. Perry was my English teacher in the 12th grade, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about English here in a minute, but... Uh, that's not a picture of her, that's Miss Perrin because I skipped head accidentally, but I couldn't find a picture of Mrs. Perry, but she's my 12th grade English teacher, and I was in honors English, and she spent the entire year uh, concentrating on not using any to-be verbs in our writing. 
we had to circle every to be verb in everything we wrote and take it out. And we were not allowed. I didn't know she was teaching active voice. I grew up in the 70s. We did free writing. I never learned to diagram a sentence. I barely knew any grammar. But I knew what to be verbs were and not to be using to be verbs. So, <clears throat> um, and then my English professor, Elaine Perrin, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about my college here in a minute. But Mrs. Perrin was a large influence on me, uh, probably more since college than during, than during college. But I did have her for two classes, and she was um, a big influence on me. <clears throat> a little bit about my childhood. Um, I mentioned that I uh, moved a lot, that I didn't have very many friends. Um, I was very shy. I know it's hard to believe. I was talkative but shy. And that was because of insecurities and lack of self-confidence and that sort of thing. But I loved two things, uh, reading and drawing. Um, I drew constantly, especially after ninth grade. Once I learned how to draw, I, um, I began, my parents subscribed to National Geographic, and I would find the best pictures in National Geographic, and I would try to co totally reproduce them. And I was actually pretty good. Um, but they were copies. They were drawing copies, you know. But I would spend hours. I, the kitchen table was cleared off, so I could spend my however many hours drawing. Um, also, uh, reading. Um, I read constantly. My uh, CB handle was bookworm, even though we had a CB and I never really talked on it, but I had to pick a handle. Um, my favorite book when I was growing up was The Little Princess by Frances Hodgson Burnett, which may tell you something about me and maybe was the start of my love of, of that type of literature. But um, my, my Aunt Janice gave me a copy when I was in, well, eight years old at Christmas, and I read it every single year. It was like, it's the beginning of summer, it's time to pull out The Little Princess. So that was my book. Um, I continued reading all the way through high school. Um, I read everything by Agatha Christie, everything by Victoria Holt, everything by Phyllis Whitney, everything, all the Lord of the Rings, um, got into fantasy. Um, I remember in college I started reading Piers Anthony. I read just everything you can imagine. I just went through one author after another and I read everything. Um, when I would go on vacation to Alabama, uh, we didn't, my mom wouldn't let us bring library books and we didn't buy books. So I had to read the books off of her bookshelf, which were the same 12 books. But they had Reader's Digest condensed versions. So I read Reader's Digest condensed versions of things like Nicholas and Alexandra and, and things like that. Um, when the kids would get together to play, I would play for the shortest possible amount I could play. And then I would say I had to go to the bathroom. And then I would be gone for the rest of the day. So... Uh, the bathroom was my office, and I spent as many hours in there as possible when I was growing up because I wanted privacy to read my books. So education and experience. <clears throat> I said already I went to three elementary schools, three junior highs, um, and then went to Richland High School and graduated class of 1979. I was quiet and studious. I was focused on art. I was focused on reading. Uh, as I said before, I was very award, uh, accomplishment and award oriented. It was ways to um, verify that I was doing the right thing and studying hard when I got an award. And I didn't really care about my family response to that. I fantasized about winning all kinds of awards. I can remember sitting in um, an award ceremony before I knew how award ceremonies worked and thinking they were going to call my name for something, not realizing that they'd already probably informed the people that were getting the awards, but <laughs> I, uh, that was a pretty big deal to me. In the, the sixth grade, uh, in the sixth grade at my junior high, I received the English award. That was a surprise. Maybe that's what gave me the idea that awards were surprises. Um, and then I, we moved for the last time, and then I was uh, at Smithfield Junior High, and, of course, this was the year I had met my friend Denise, and she was a very good artist. And I can remember going, please, 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 please let me get the art award. But she got the art award. I got the English award. It felt like the consolation prize. Um, in high school, I competed in art and uh, did all kinds of uh, things related to that. Uh, I had every class with my friend Denise. Um, we had lockers next to each other. We both worked on the yearbook in 12th grade, and the yearbook professor, teacher really liked me 
a lot and he chose my cover for the yearbook so I got the English award and <laughs> and Denise got the art award so uh, I didn't talk about this at all in my presentation so I'm going to just say just in case you're wondering what happened to Denise uh, we both went to TCJC, Tarrant County Junior College, our first year on full scholarship. Then she got a full scholarship to TCU when I came to LCU. She opened her own art advertising studio. Um, she is now a vice president for, uh, I've gone totally blank. I showed you the thing the other day. She has a very high skyscraper office in Philadelphia as the vice president for a major telephone uh, communications company that starts with a C. Comcast? Yes, Comcast. She's one of the top women executives at Comcast now. So, yeah, she's important and rich. And she came from an even more working class background than I did. So, all right, college education. As I said, I went to Tarrant County Junior College. Um, my senior high school advisor, senior high school advisor set me up to take the test to get into DCJC um, that gave you a full scholarship and I got it. A lot of people got that. And then um, got a sudden call from her in summer and she had gotten me a Rotary Club scholarship for $250 to pay for books and supplies. So I didn't do anything for that. She just, I think she felt sorry for me. I think she saw, here's this girl, she's in the top 10 in her class. She hasn't applied to a single school, you know, here, here's the scholarship. So um, I had to do academic testing when I got there. And so I remember I had to take this battery of tests. It was part of this class, orientation class. And uh, the advisor sat me down. And they, this ha happened to me a couple times in my life. And he looked at me and he said, you have really superior scores. You can do anything you want. You pick a major, you're OK. Problem is, you don't want to do anything. My highest score, they have like a percentage. It was some kind of what d career do you fit the best. My highest one was under 50%, just so you'll know. And it was college professor. <laughs> um, I think this is showing up at the wrong time. But um, I wanted to talk about why I ended up at LCU. Um, my father applied for a transfer to Hawaii. And he got it, and I thought they were moving to Hawaii. And by that point in time, I'd gone to a year of Tarrant County Junior College, and I had decided I was ready to spread my wings and move off. And I wanted to go to a Christian university, and I had it down to ACU or LCU, the reason, or LCC at the time. The reason I was looking at LCC was because of Pam and Lloyd Massey. I don't know if any of you know them. That's a more current picture of them, not what they looked like when he was my youth minister in high school. But Pam took me and my friend Sandy on a road trip in my freshman year of college to LCC, introduced me to David Carter, said I needed to go here. I came here anyway. I came here anyway. Yes, I did. And in the meantime, my dad and mom went to Hawaii and decided they couldn't afford to live there even on that salary, and they didn't go. But the reason I was picking LCC was a combination of Pam's influence and the fact that I thought it would be difficult to fly home to Hawaii for every break. And Pam's parents, the Ludie and uh, Rose Massey, were going to let me live with them on their breaks. And so that's the reason I came here. Um, I ended up uh, declaring art as my major. And uh, my dad, by this point in time, he just put his hands up and said, might as well. If you're not going to pick anything that will make you any money, why not be an art major? So that is actually, I'm quoting him. Um, <laughs> My mom talked me into getting certified to teach. She kept saying, you can do that at the same time. You can just get certification. You might want to be a teacher. And I kept saying, I never want to be a teacher. I never want to be a teacher. But I did it to make her happy. I thought it was a good compromise. So I took the minimum number of education courses I needed to take to be certified, and I had to declare a second teaching field. So I went, hmm, English. Yeah, that's why I picked that degree. Um... I thought it'd be kind of interesting to show some pictures of the teachers that I had. I got this from my junior year book. Um, this is the art department in my junior year. You probably recognize a couple of these people. Um, 
Mr. Roberts was my advisor, my academic advisor. And um, I had a couple of classes with Karen Randolph. And I actually had quite a few classes with uh, uh, Han Sun Ling because I was uh, commercial art oriented. So I had every class he taught. And I remember when they called me in and said, we're dropping this degree because they were basically getting rid of Mr. Ling. And so I had to be a regular art major. But I was influenced by all of these. And someday I can tell you stories on all of them. But I don't have time today. And then here's the English department at that time. I had classes. I had one class. My very first English class here was with Dr. Green. Um, I had had, just to let you know, I had taken my freshman and sophomore English at TCJC. Um, my mother wouldn't let me take the test because it cost money, and I was going free, so I could take the class for free. And uh, even though I won the English award, I mean, seriously, I could have clipped it. But she said, you might need to know something in that class. So I'm one of the few English professors you know that has actually had freshman English. Um, and honestly, second, year freshman, second semester freshman English was challenging. I started making Bs for the very first time in English because I didn't know how to write a thesis statement or organize a five-paragraph essay because I was taught by free writing people. And so I didn't know how to do a structured essay. So I did learn a lot, actually, in those classes. I took two classes at UT Arlington over the summer in English. Um, and so I really only had, I believe, I counted four English classes here at LCC, LCU. Had majority somewhere else. So I had um, Dr. Green for Shakespeare, my only B in English. And probably when people say now, Dr. Privet doesn't like Shakespeare, it has something to do with that class. But <laughs> I had that class with Lori Lawless. That was... And she got the A. Aww. So um, I, there were four students in that class, Becky Pretty and Gay Hadley. We were the only four. I was the only sophomore. And I remember is either Becky or Gay pulled me aside and said, you do know you're not going to make an A, don't you? And I said, no. She said, Lori's in the class, and he only gives one A, and she'll get it. <laughs> so, okay. So um, I never had Dr. Reed when I was here. Um, I, did, I had... Dr. Barry Hill for a History of English Language class, and I had Elaine Perrin for a Multicultural Literature and the Teaching English course that we had to take. And I didn't do a particularly impressive job in either of those classes, but she evidently saw something in me that made her think that I would be a good English teacher. <clears throat> Social Club was really important to me, um, which is kind of ironic because I was a little bit of a socialist when I came to LCU or LCC. And uh, I thought social clubs were elitist and didn't want to participate in any kind of system that rated people or ranked or voted or anything like that. Uh, my friends talked me into it. <laughs> Peer pressure. And uh, I got into Kappa, and there's me up in the top right-hand corner with a bunch of my friends. Um, the main reason I decided to do uh, social clubs was because of Master Follies. That's actually me in the yearbook, and the year we were Martians. And um, I uh, wanted to be involved with Master Follies, and that was one of my huge things when I was here. I was the prop painter. Back then we had props, and they were on these big, massive canvases. And that was just in my wheelhouse, you know. And so I planned them. I gave people jobs, and we, I drew them out, and... They had to fill in the paints and all that kind of stuff. But I was the primary architect of all the props, uh, and I loved it. And I even did it my senior, I did it my senior year when I was doing um, student teaching, and I did it the year after I graduated. I came back and did the props. Um, so I don't know. The year, if anybody remembers the marionettes year, um, that I did those. So those were my props. It was fun. Um, well... Academic honors were really important to me, as I said. I just thought this was kind of funny. This was a page from my junior yearbook. And there I am under junior academic excellence. And you can kind of see people's names there. And a couple of names you may recognize. Under sophomore academic excellence. <laughs> Alicia Vinson was my best friend at school. She's Alicia Bennett now. Her son, Donovan Bennett, is a student here. Okay, also 
um, my senior art show. We had to do them then, and I found a couple of photographs. There's me in the middle, uh, my sister in the background, um, Charles Mickey. I don't know if any of you knew that I was going to Broadway, and he was the college minister. And then that's my roommate, Debbie, and uh, some of my art back there. We didn't have to have a theme then. We just had to put pictures up and name them. So it was a little bit easier. We didn't have to write a paper or anything. Okay, early work experiences. Um, I knew I needed two years of work experience to be a graphic artist. So I got a job when I was a senior in a local print shop doing lots of different kinds of things. I learned to typeset. And then after I graduated, I got a job with CompuShare, also known as Kinetrix, where I worked for five years. I started off as their artist um, and gradually began doing pretty much everything. Um, I was the person, Marvin Prosno figured out that if he brought me manuals for the new software he bought, that I would figure out how to use it and teach everybody how to use it. So that's what I ended up doing. And I, I worked as a technical writer the last couple, of, technical writer the last couple of years. Um, a lot of people think that Brian and I dated in college because we were the same year, but actually I knew who he was, but I didn't really know him until I went to work at CompuShare. This is a picture I thought would be kind of embarrassing to show um, for Brian. That's Brian on the right in his Kia dye shirt and short shorts. And you might recognize Elizabeth Jackson next to him. Yeah, they weren't dating, but they were good friends. And this was the, right after he graduated, about the time I started falling for him. And we were working together at CompuShare, and he was off in Hawaii getting very tan and looking very cute. And um, we were working together, and we started dating after this. Um, and we got married in 1985. Um, and this became, you know, the focus of my life uh, after my children and uh, started thinking about going to, to grad school. Um, I love this series of pictures here of my kids. This is about the age they were, maybe a little older than when I first started going to grad school. I had been thinking ever since I w had gotten out of school that maybe I did want to be a college professor. And I was going to softball games. Brian was playing softball on a team with Les Perrin and Tim Perrin and a bunch of other people. And I would sit in the stands with Lucy and Elaine. And Elaine would say, when are you going back to grad school? When are you getting your master's in English so you can come back and take my job? And she was very encouraging for me to do that. And so I went back to school. Um, I thought I'd show just a couple more family pictures here. Here's a picture of my kids when they were in middle school, high school. We went to Hawaii right before Austin graduated. Like I said, excuse to show pictures of my family. Um, went back to grad school. And, of course, I went to Texas Tech because my husband had a job here. Um, I thought I would be a composition and rhetoric specialist because I thought that would be the best way for me to get a job. Um, and my advisor in college just never really let me take any composition and rhetoric courses. He kept putting me in literature courses, and so I thought, oh, okay, I guess I'll be a literature major. And then I thought I would go the master's thesis track, and he just never, nobody ever told me how to go about doing that. And pretty soon he said, oh, no, you're going non-thesis. And I said, okay, I guess I'll go non-thesis. And so I got my master's degree in English in 1995. Um, I interviewed at LCU when Elaine retired, and I didn't get hired. So then I thought, I might as well get a Ph.D. So I uh, started the work for my Ph.D. Um, one of the classes I had when I was at Tech was with Dr. Sherry Sneeza. And in that class, we had to read The Silent Partner by Elizabeth Stuart Phelps, and I just loved it. And she was talking about another book that Elizabeth Stuart Phelps had written called The Story of Avis, and it really appealed to me, the plot. And so that semester, okay, I told you I was an overachiever. I read that book anyway just because it was option, you know, just because I wanted to. So I read the extra book, and I was really impressed with it, and we had discussions about it and so forth. And then it came time to choose my committee for my dissertation, and um, I got a lot of advice. Um, choose the committee that will help you graduate the fastest. Choose somebody who's done lots of, of these. Um, so I thought, I think I'll work with Dr. Acock. I really like short stories, and I talked to him a while, and, and I decided to do maybe Ann Tyler, and I was going to work with Dr. Dagestani, and they were both very well-respected, really, really easy to get along with kinds of people, and I thought this will be great. Um, but the problem was that I realized that my reading list was going to be difficult because 
I had been focusing without intending to on 19th century literature. And so my, I was looking at contemporary literature and I had no solid background. It wasn't very good. And so I was behind and I kept thinking, I should just work with Dr. Sinisa. So I went to talk to her and she got so excited and I got so excited and I thought, this is who I want to work with. And um, I went to several of my friends and said, here's what I'm thinking about doing. And they said, don't do it. Don't work with Dr. Sinisa. You'll never finish. Um, I, I thought about it a long time, but I ended up going with my gut and working with Dr. Sinisa. And of all the people I've ever talked to, I had the smoothest experience on my dissertation. Um, she didn't have anybody else she was working on because everybody was afraid of her. Uh, she had a reputation for being a perfectionist. And what we did, and she helped me with every step of the project, we interlibrary loaned every book, almost every book Phelps ever wrote, plus all her articles. And so we read them together for months. Um, I would Xerox copy every book I got. And these were old books, 1870s, 1880s. They were falling apart. They hadn't been reprinted. And so I left lots of Xerox copies with little pieces of brown paper. And I made Xerox copies of every book. One of us read the book. One read the Xerox copy. Every two weeks we'd meet and we'd discuss the book. So we had all these meetings. So when we studied, when I stayed for my quals, I was very ready on the list of Phelps. And we had worked on it together. The other two people on my committee were very cooperative and easy to get along with. And uh, when I would spend two or three weeks working on a chapter and give it to her, she would have it back to me in two days. <sighs> Just the fastest turnaround I've ever heard of. So things went well, and I graduated in 99 in December with my PhD. Here's my dissertation topic or title. Art for Truth's Sake, Elizabeth Stuart Phelps is realist, reformer, and stylist. Um, in researching this topic, not only, I told you I'd already read all these books. I didn't read her children's books or the Christian biography she wrote with her husband, but I read all her fiction and most of her essays, because there was a lot. Um, but I, I researched women's rights, labor reform, the temperance movement, and even the anti-vivisection movement. I was able to research correspondence. I got correspondence from Henry James and a lot of other people regarding her, that whether she had written to them or they'd written to her. Um, I got off on a sidetrack for a little while when I was doing my research on social Christianity, and I found out about this man named Washington Gladden, and I thought that one of her characters was based on him. And so I ended up corresponding with a, with a Chicago library with, for all of his manuscripts, and I read all that. It kind of took me off topic, but it was so fun. And I love research. Um, I could research all the time. Uh, I, just, I just love it. So how did I come back to LCU? Well, as I told you before, I thought I had a job. Lane Perrin kept saying, when I retire, you're going to take my job. And not realizing at the time, by Tim, not realizing at the time that um, just because Lane Perrin thought I should take her job didn't mean I would get a job. So I didn't get that job um, in 1995. Um, I ended up being called when I was on vacation in, I think it was the summer of 98. I remember I was on the beach. and Anyway, I don't remember how it all happened, but I got called. Somebody had pulled, might have been Dr. Blassingame, I don't even remember, but somebody had caught, pulled my resume from a file and wanted to know if I wanted to teach a class. And so I said, yeah, maybe, yeah. <laughs> so I did, and I taught here that year, and then a uh, job opening came up that next year, and I decided to apply for it. I thought about it a long time, because by that time, um, I wasn't sure I wanted to work here anymore be honest with you. I kind of had my feelings hurt. And I also thought that I was maybe possibly meant for better things. Let's put quote marks around that. Uh, that I could get a job pretty much anywhere. And, uh, but Brian and I decided, he was very supportive, and he said, interview for the job, pray about it. If you get it, good. If you don't get it, I will move wherever you get a job. And so I interviewed. Um, I got it. And I got the assistant professor of English job. Um, at the time I interviewed, I had only finished about two chapters of my dissertation. And I spent the summer working on it and was up to about chapter six. And then finished in the fall, which was a crazy semester. It's kind of a blur. Um, I had to rewrite everything, you know, all the, the final edits, 
finish, finish chapter 6 and 7, the Appendices Table of Contents, uh, plus first semester teaching. I defended in November, graduated in December. Um, and I've just had so many opportunities since I've been here um, for professional and personal growth that I didn't expect, so much better than I expected. Uh, I brought a dissertation, the book that I did from my dissertation, some articles, some journals that I've published articles in. It's been fun. I like to write, like to research still. Um, I have an excellent group of colleagues, all here, some of them here. <coughs> I have, um, <coughs> oh, I want to show you this. Last semester, I worked with Alyssa Middleton. She was our first intern. And basically, for an unpaid intern, she created a website for Elizabeth Stewart Phelps. Hopefully, it'll open. It's not doing anything, is it? Huh. May not work in here. I've just got a white screen here. Let me try it one more time. I'll try double clicking it. Well, I can go to it. Well, let's see. I don't want to run out of time. Let me go forward and then I'll see if I can pull up the website here in a minute. Okay. I'll close out the PowerPoint. And I just had a couple of other things to say. I like this picture. There's Shanae and Susan uh, in our funny blue hats. I work with great, great people. Um, I've had the chance to, to work the school where my son attended, which was beyond wonderful, um, since he wasn't an embarrassment most of the time. Um, that's also, that's my nephew in the middle and my niece over on the left, and I had two other nephews who attended here. They were all here at the same time. and It couldn't have been more fun. Um, because of that, um, you know, Austin uh, met his wife here. That's a picture of us at the George W. Bush event. There's uh, my daughter graduated from ACU, where she attended on full tuition scholarship because of my job here partly, partly because she's really great. Um, and... Um, and then here's a Christmas picture that I like that has everybody, including my daughter-in-law and my mother-in-law, in the picture. So we have a good time. It's been wonderful raising my kids in Lubbock and working here. It's been a wonderful environment. Um, my son, you know, because of seeing me go work here, my kids, uh, they both ended up in graduate school. Emily's graduating in May with speech pathology. Carla graduated in December with social work from LCU. Um, Austin should graduate next May in physical chemistry. And uh, he wants to be a college professor too. Let's see. I can exit out of here. Yeah, it's, it's acting like I don't want to show it. That's the website. It's just coming up blank. Anyway, it was um, it's a website that uh, has her biography, my biography. It has, I'm trying to put a lot of articles that she's written and published that have been out of print for years that people can use as resources for the research. So just to make it an open database or whatever you want to call it, just an open connection to a lot of previously unavailable articles and essays. So that was a lot of fun, but I don't know why it's not opening. So I think that's all I have. I'll ask the first question. Um, you know, you said you uh, like to write and research, but I've heard you in recent years say, I'm not writing anything this year. <laughs> so are you lying in your presentation or are you lying to anything? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was my intention not to write anything, but then I have these ideas for things I want to write. And so 
you know, I wrote that paper for CCTE presentation last fall, so I'm still writing occasionally. But the pressure's off, which is really nice. Um, at one point in time, I wanted to try my hand at fiction. I don't think I'm a fiction writer. I still have it in the back of my mind that I might want to write some historical murder mysteries. Mm -hmm. um, I want to, the main character would be a detective based on Elizabeth Stuart Phelps. She would be a feminist, social, prissy woman, because that's who she was. She was a very prim and proper old maid who married a man 17 years younger than herself when she was in her 40s. Oh, wow. Yeah, and uh, who was dedicated to women's rights and yet was not really very uh, socially active. She, she was more of a Christian kind of prim and proper woman, and I think she'd make a really interesting murder mystery heroine um, of some type, and she would travel to Europe or something, and she would run into some dead bodies or something. I haven't figured out any more than that, but I know her personality so well. I wouldn't call her this person, but I would make her that, I would use her personality and then give her a whole different name and identity, and then, yeah. But that's all I have is but like... you're not going to do anything. I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. Because when it comes down to it, I've got other things to do. Like go to Disneyland and yes. rework budgets and yeah. Other questions? You mentioned your grand, great grandfather in Arkansas. Yes. Where was he from in Arkansas? Do you have relatives like, in Arkansas? Like white? I don't. Well, that's what I'm saying. I know nothing. There's this little statement in a Bible that says from White County, Arkansas. White County. Well, that's where Cersei is. That's okay. Where Hardy is. It's that's all I know. <laughs> no, no family. I know his origins before he left home. That's all I know. So somewhere in White County. I guess so. <laughs> I know White something. <laughs> I think it's White County. Do you read a lot of mysteries? I do. What, who, who are your authors? Well, I have a lot of them. Um, they've changed through the years. You know, I've read everything by the traditional, the Agatha Christie's and, and Gail Marsh and P.D. James. And then I started reading, uh, uh, I'm, I'm drawing some blanks. I mean, I went through that whole... Um, historical romance, gothic thing, like I said, with Phyllis Whitney and those kinds of things are not really murder mysteries. But uh, as I've gotten older, uh, I've, I started reading Sue Grafton a few years ago, so I still keep up with her. Uh, uh, Susan put me on to Louise Penny. I absolutely love Louise Penny. Um, there's, uh, there's the one that writes all the... She's the writer up in the Northeast who's a college English professor. Um, she hasn't written anything recently. I love those. Um, Pretty much if you tell me this is a good murder mystery writer, I'll start reading it. So, I've never read Dorothy Sayers. Is Dorothy Sayers really good? Okay, I need, to read, I need to put that on my list then. You know. Okay, okay. Okay. Oh, Ann Perry. I've read all the Ann Perrys. Yeah, I read the ones uh, with Amelia Peabody, Elizabeth Peters. In Egypt, I read all those. Okay, so Dorothy Sayers. I need to read Dorothy Sayers. I don't know why I missed that one, but I did. I know I've missed some, but I have to get recommendations because I don't want to just start reading somebody and not know if it's going to be good. But, yeah, I love murder mysteries. I'm reading um, El Zinga's. I just started. That's coming for the Scholars Colloquium. Mm -hmm. I just started reading his first one. We're going to do a mystery panel mm -hmm. for the Scholars Colloquium. Because he's written three novels, co-written three novels with a, a friend of his, and the sleuth is an econo uh, economics professor. At mm -hmm. Harvard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm only on chapter three, so I haven't gotten far enough in it. Dr. Fair and I appreciate the way you teach context when you teach literature and your, your, uh, your affinity for historical narrative. Which is really funny because when I was growing up, I did not like history at all. And I, I did not enjoy my history you, you classes. Enjoy yeah, I didn't like history classes even in college. I didn't like history classes. And for the record, I didn't take less parent for no. history. <laughs> I had did all my history at Tarrant County Junior College and didn't need any more history. And um, so the history that I have now is what I have learned on my own from the research I've done. So I'm spotty. That's cool. My history is a little bit spottier than it could be. If I teach something, I research all the history. Because I can't. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm solid there. Up through World War II, I'm pretty solid. But in, in England, 
not as much. Victorian is about it, but do you still draw? You know, not really. Um, it's it's a skill that doesn't completely go away. So if you were to hand me something and ask me to draw it, I'm not saying I would be as good as I used to be, but I'd do a pretty good job. I just don't enjoy it anymore. So I used to uh, kind of almost crave it. Like I just needed to draw. And I never feel that anymore, so I don't do it. It's kind of switched in a way. I guess you could say when I was younger, I drew almost professionally, even though I wasn't getting paid for it. And reading was my hobby, and I read whatever I wanted now I have to read things that I have to read, and drawing would have to be enough interesting to me to do it, and it just isn't right now. But I've done a couple of paintings. I had a really old painting over in the art show, the alumni art show, some of you may have seen. Um, I do a painting about once every three to four years, but I'm not that good. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Dr. Privet. Mm -hmm.